and somebody who is uh, known very well to us, uh, Congressman Adam Schiff will be joining us to, uh, to discuss some of the events that are impacting all of us in this era of the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Um, the organization, the AEMS, is, has been working hard. We have been reassessing and reframe, reframing the situation. Today is April 23rd, uh, 2020. And the, the information that we're going to share today is pertinent for today. Um, and as things are changing, please be cognizant of that. We um, have been bringing the latest medical information almost daily on these types of virtual webinars, varying in different disciplines within healthcare. Today, though, we're going to shift gears and we're going to talk a little bit about the congressional response to this pandemic. Uh, joining me today on the panel is the president of the organization, the president of the Armenian American Medical Society. Dr. Kevin Galastian. Dr. Galastian is an obstetrician and a gynecologist. He truly is one of the healthcare heroes that we have been seeing. Uh, not only is he remaining to work for his patients, he's also taken on the load for several other physicians who are at high risk and cannot work. And he has been uh, um, covering a number of hospitals. So with that, I'd like to invite Dr. Galstian, if you can enable your uh, video and your microphone, and please give us your introductory remarks. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead, Dr. Galstian. Good evening, dear friends. On behalf of the Armenian American Medical Society, I'm honored to welcome you all to this virtual town hall style gathering where we'll be joined by Congressman Adam Schiff of California's 28th Congressional District. During his tenure in public life, Congressman Schiff has focused his efforts on growing the economy, bolstering national security, helping small businesses, and improving education, safety, and healthcare for our children. Congressman Schiff has been a longtime friend and advocate of the Armenian community. And we get ready to commemorate the 105th year of the Armenian genocide tomorrow. We are honored to be joined by him. Congressman, it is my distinguished honor to welcome you to the screen and invite you to take over the Zoom platform. Please enable your video and I'll, would, and I'll disable my video now. So, thank you. Uh, doctor, thank you very much. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to address you all this evening. I hope everyone uh, that's viewing is uh, healthy and their families are good uh, through these very trying times. Uh, I thought uh, just to start off uh, this evening, I would give you a little update on what we did in Congress today, uh, what things look like in terms of further congressional action in the near future. Uh, but before I do, I just want to once again uh, say thank you for inviting me, but also for so many of you that are on the front lines of uh, fighting this virus right now, that are continuing to see patients uh, taking uh, risks for yourself and your families. Um, I want to express the gratitude of all the constituents uh, that I represent. We're deeply grateful uh, for your dedication, your courage, and your medical skills uh, at this time of profound need in our community and in our country. Uh, and I know that many of you are donating your time and energy and expertise through telemedicine, uh, not only to people in our community, but indeed all over the world. Uh, so thank you for what you're doing. Uh, today, uh, we had votes uh, for really only the second time where we met in person as a Congress uh, in the last four weeks. Uh, I've had to go to the Capitol more frequently than that uh, as the chair of the Intelligence Committee. Uh, I need access to classified information, which I can't do remotely. Uh, so my work has made it uh, impossible for me to completely telework. But nonetheless, uh, we have avoided having 435 people come from all over the country, get on planes, and then congregate in a single room. Um, it was necessary today 
uh, to take up uh, two measures, one to create a bipartisan panel uh, to oversee the expenditure of these funds, these trillions of dollars of funds that we're out allocating both for the healthcare response, but also to deal with the economic crisis that the country is facing. Uh, we want to make sure that problems are identified, that the funds go out in an equitable way, uh, that there's not uh, waste, fraud, or abuse in the use of the funds. Uh, and of course, we have seen some problems already. Uh, the Small Business Fund, for example, uh, experienced uh, problems where you had uh, lucrative businesses or businesses that didn't need the help. Uh, accessing the help and leaving other mom and pop businesses left high and dry. Uh, you had a problem with some large financial institutions, large banks uh, who were giving uh, favored treatment to their larger, more lucrative customers. Uh, so it's important that we do oversight, that we make programmatic changes uh, where needed to make sure that uh, whatever we're spending now is keeping people employed whenever possible, providing adequate unemployment compensation when it's not possible, uh, helping small businesses keep their doors open, helping hospitals and healthcare providers keep their doors open and make sure that they get the protective gear that they need. So uh, that was the first bill is the oversight bill. Uh, the second bill we took up replenished the small business funds, adding about 300 billion more. Uh, we also set aside about 60 billion of those 300 billion for small community-based lending institutions uh, to make it uh, more likely that those small businesses that are the customers of those small institutions can get the help that they need. Uh, we still though need to deal with the problem of small businesses who are customers of big banks uh, that have that established relationship with the bank and can easily go to a different financial institution. We want to make sure they get taken care of as well. So a big chunk of what we allocated today was to replenish the funds for that program to keep small businesses afloat, to let them continue to make payroll, pay rent and utilities until we get on the other side of this uh, pandemic. Um, we also though allocated 75 billion for hospitals and health providers. Uh, we know, uh, and you, you're I'm sure much more aware of this than anything I could tell you, uh, how uh, difficult it is for hospitals right now, given that we have put off most elective surgeries uh, some have put off all elective surgeries up until this point, and that's often the profit center for a hospital. Uh, we need to make sure that the hospitals uh, can keep their doors open uh, and that, uh, um, that we have access to care. I think the prediction by the director of the CDC uh, is one that we need to keep in mind. That is that uh, when the winter comes again, uh, and we see the virus coming back, uh, we'll also have to deal with flu season, and if it's a bad flu season, that alone puts a strain uh, on our healthcare system. But if it's coupled with a COVID uh, reemergence at the same time, it's gonna really stress our healthcare system. So uh, we allocated uh, 75 billion to try to get our hospitals and clinics ready uh, for whatever comes. Importantly, we also allocated 25 billion for testing. Uh, and required the, there to be a development by the administration of a national plan for testing. Now, not all that has to be done by the federal government, but we need federal leadership so that we don't have states forced to compete with each other uh, in terms of obtaining, whether it's protective gear or swabs or reagent or whatever is necessary to make sure that people can be safely tested, um, that we can uh, have the contract tracing put in place um, if we're really to think seriously at any point about reopening the economy, it's going to be necessary for us to test a much greater percentage of our population than we have thus far, and not just to test them, but to trace the course of the virus. Uh, you've probably seen within the last week uh, a number of studies at Stanford, USC, and elsewhere indicating that the percentage of Californians and indeed New Yorkers and others who are positive for the virus is many times higher than what we knew. Uh, and we're gonna have to have good data on the virus and where it is uh, if we're going to contemplate at some point reopening the economy. So we need to invest in testing, we need to invest in tracing, we need to have the capacity to isolate those who are sick. Uh, we need to have the resources and the capacity in our hospitals and our health system. Uh, and we're gonna need to continue to socially distance until uh, we uh, develop a vaccine. 
Um, and uh, I'm you know, hopeful that in the interim, we will develop effective treatments, but there's still conflicting uh, evidence about the treatments that have been experimented with so, with so far. Um, some that look promising that turned out not to be, uh, others that we really hadn't tested and found out their, their uh, un, uh, undesirable um, consequences of the treatment. So we have a long way to go um, and a lot to do. I uh, have been favoring a, a broader approach, frankly, than the one we've employed thus far. That would have the federal government essentially guarantee payroll until we get through this. That's something European countries are doing. Uh, I don't think it costs any more than the approach we're already taking, but it's a simpler, I think more equitable approach uh, that doesn't allow either banks or the administration to pick winners and losers uh, and would help all uh, businesses stay afloat during this difficult time. So let me pause there and I look forward to your questions and your comments and the discussion tonight. And I'm grateful for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Congressman. Um, and I would like to encourage everybody to go ahead and uh, place your questions in the form of the Q&A. You can check in the Q&A box and um, submit your questions that way. You may also submit your questions um, uh, on via the chat box. If you are watching on Facebook Live, we are monitoring your questions as well. So please uh, feel free to either switch over to Zoom um, or place your questions in the Facebook, uh, Facebook uh, comments section. We have a question from Dr. Apelian, Dr. Rami Apelian, who is uh, one of our board members. And Dr. Apelian says, Congressman Schiff, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell stated that he would rather states declare bankruptcy over providing federal support. What does that mean to the residents of California? Well, I, you know, I saw those statements and I found them uh, deeply distressing. That is not an answer to say, well, the states can just go bankrupt. Uh, right now, uh, you know, those states uh, facing the most financial difficulty may be states the president cares less about, but there are gonna be red states as well as blue states that have deep financial problems uh, in cities all over the country uh, and as the states uh, are employers of police and firefighters and teachers and uh, healthcare workers, among many others, uh, to just say that they should go bankrupt isn't a responsible answer right now. Uh, the states obviously are going through a huge challenge in coping with uh, the demands right now. I can imagine in the State Department, the Employment Development Department, EDD, where they're processing unemployment applications, They've never seen anything like what they're confronting right now. Uh, I don't think we want to add to the layoffs by laying off uh, all of our state workers or a lot of our state workers uh, or our city workers. And I think the risk of making the problem worse uh, is that much greater if we adopt a bankruptcy approach. Uh, now, I think that that calculus is going to change as this pandemic moves through the country and more states are affected. But I, I really don't think that's a responsible answer. And you're already seeing Republican governors and Democratic governors uh, call out Mitch McConnell for that suggestion, uh, which I think was, was a very cavalier uh, answer to a very serious problem that the states are facing right now. Thank you, Congressman. We have another question in regards to testing. And the question goes, Testing is obviously necessary before the economy is reopened. Recently, however, uh, even the tests that are developed in the US, such as the one by Abbott uh, rapid test, there's a nearly 15% false positive rate. Uh, what is the federal government's plan to ensure that future testing is reliable? Germany has committed today to test 150,000 daily until um, the entire country is tested. Is that feasible in the United States? Well, it certainly should be feasible. And, you know, one of the things that uh, we're going to have to answer uh, in all of this is why we are so, so far behind much of the other industrialized world, why countries like South Korea and Singapore and Taiwan uh, were so much more capable of ramping up testing in short order doing the tracing necessary to prevent the kind of widespread um, prevalence of the virus that we see in the United States. 
Now, one of the things that we did in the bill that passed today was call on the administration, require them to develop a national testing plan. Uh, and that should include identifying the most um, successful tests, those with the least false positives or false negatives. Um, it, it, you know, there's also a very serious problem with uh, the antibody and antigen tests. Uh, you know, 90% of those that are being used right now have not been vetted and a lot of them are just junk. Uh, there are only four tests that have been approved. And so uh, whether it's testing for the virus itself uh, in the present or testing for um, the antibodies and antigens uh, that indicate the presence of the virus in the past, uh, we need to make sure that we're using good tests. One of the reasons we are as far behind as we were is that the CDC um, made mistakes in the rollout of its first test. The first test was plagued with problems and had to recall those tests. Uh, and that meant we lost precious weeks uh, in the beginning of this uh, pandemic. Uh, so um, there, there really has to be a, a leadership role here at the federal level to make sure that we have the gold standard in terms of testing uh, and that we identify tests that not only are effective, not only have a reduced number of false positives or negatives, but also that, um, that can be performed without burning through protective gear, um, without uh, developing shortages of reagents and other materials necessary to conduct the tests. Um, you know, the, the hospitals in our district, uh, and you, many of your members are much more familiar with this than I am, but I stay in touch with our hospitals. Um, they may have tests, but there's a lack of reagent to get the results of these tests. It's still taking far too long and there's far too little availability of these tests. Uh, and if you don't know whether someone is positive or negative, you end up churning through protective gear uh, in a way that you might not need to if you had a good rapid answer to a test. So we need a national response to this. Uh, and I hope that both with the resources we provided today, as well as the mandate we imposed uh, that the administration develop a coherent, strong national testing strategy, we can move up to the really uh, millions of tests uh, each week rather than tens or hundreds of thousands of tests a week. I think with a population as large as ours, that's really going to be what's necessary. Yes, those are great points. We have a question uh, from somebody on the East Coast. Um, given the reported gutting of the intelligence community leadership by the current administration, how confident are you in the information you are getting as a part of the intelligence committee, specifically with respect to controversy around the source of COVID and other potential threats? Uh, you know, it's a very good question. Um, I am deeply concerned with the new leadership of the intelligence community. Uh, the head of the, the, we call it the IC, the intelligence community, is a guy named Rick Rennell, uh, who is a loyalist of the president, and there's nothing wrong with that, but he has no intelligence experience. So to take someone whose only qualification is being loyal to the president and put them in charge of our intelligence agencies is bound to create a problem and politicize the intelligence. And indeed, we've already seen disturbing signs of that happening uh, in terms of the threat to the integrity of our elections coming from foreign countries. Uh, now, I was just in today reviewing the intelligence on the virus, what we know about where the virus came from, uh, what we know of what the Chinese are saying to us, what we know about what the Chinese are saying around the world, misinformation they're pushing out, what the Russians are doing, what others are doing. Uh, and it's vitally important that not just the Congress get that information, but that ultimately Americans are given the straight scoop. Uh, we see you know, and this is in, in open source, so this is public reporting I can talk about. We see the Chinese pushing out misinformation about the virus. Uh, China has um, a, an interest in uh, trying to use the virus to make the argument that its autocratic model is better than democracy because they're more effective in the handling of the virus. They have fewer casualties, fewer infections. Now, of course, this ignores their complicity in the virus getting out of control uh, and the misinformation coming out of China, the misinformation about human-human transfers in particular. Uh, so there's a lot uh, to criticize about China here. Uh, at the same time, um, it's very important that we 
have a good window into what the Chinese are doing now. Uh, and we, we can see, I think, that the president has decided there are political advantages to attacking China uh, and blaming China for some of the failures of our own uh, here in the United States in terms of stopping the pandemic. And I wouldn't want the president's political objective to start influencing what the intelligence agencies are reporting to us. Uh, so for example, there is a um, narrative being pushed out that the, uh, the virus started uh, as a biological weapon in a Chinese lab. Um, and there are other um, narratives or allegations being pushed out. Okay, maybe it wasn't a biological weapon, but maybe the virus started in a lab that was doing experiments and escaped the lab. Um, I, you know, I don't want to see um, information that is unvetted um, uh, given credence. Uh, I do want to see any reasonable scenario investigated. Uh, and the absence of evidence of something doesn't mean it's not possible. But I want to make sure that we're not engaged in our own misinformation. Um, just because of what the Chinese are doing. So it's really important that the intelligence community level with the Congress, uh, that they speak truth to power, whether the Congress wants to hear it or the president wants to hear it, we need them to speak candidly to us. So I do view as a big part of my job, um, doing the oversight necessary to make sure we get good answers. Uh, but to, to get back to the question, uh, given the lack of experience of now the head of the intelligence community, given his sort of hardcore partisan loyalty uh, to the president, uh, it does uh, make me concerned and not just me. We, we saw an editorial in the Washington Post um, just a couple of weeks ago of several former senior intelligence um, leaders, including Trump's own appointment acting director McGuire, who was fired by the president, raising alarm bells of the politicization of intelligence. Uh, and so um, there are both former Republican appointees and former Democratic appointees who have been sound, sounding the alarm about this, and it's something that we have to take seriously. Great point, great points there. We have a question from Dr. Bagdasarian, who's uh, one of our former past presidents and current board members. He says, Congressman Schiff, in terms of misinformation that the Chinese um, are creating on Facebook and Twitter and et cetera. Why has the information not been removed from these social media sites? Uh, you know, that's a great question. Um, Facebook recently announced that it was gonna notify its users uh, when um, it received, when those users received misinformation. There's a lot of um, misinformation being pushed out online right now. Now, some of it's being pushed out by China Others are being pushed out by malicious domestic actors. Uh, others, you know, you know, we even before all this, of course, um, we had a, you know, quite a vigorous online anti-vaccination campaign. Um, and in fact, I uh, earned the ire of the anti-vaccination crowd by talking about the importance of vaccinations. Well, vaccinations for the flu are going to be even more important this year because to the degree that people get vaccinated and protected against the flu, they're not gonna end up in the hospital with serious um, uh, repercussions from the flu uh, at the same time where others are in the hospital with serious repercussions from COVID. Um, so uh, Facebook has, has announced they're taking the step of notifying people when they were exposed to misinformation. Now it's unclear how broadly Facebook is gonna interpret that policy. Is it just going to be when people got bad information, for example, about treatment that might affect their health? For example, if there were people pushing out the uh, was a hydroxychloroquine uh, as a miracle cure, um, where it's really needed for the treatment of lupus, uh, and it's in short supply right now because people have been advocating this without scientific basis. Indeed, the very first study to come back, I think, within the VA uh, showed that it ended up hurting people more than helping them. Uh, and so I, I think they, Facebook is certainly gonna look at misinformation along those lines uh, and try to push out uh, notice to uh, viewers uh, of their platform that they got misinformation. I've written recently to the other major platforms like Twitter, 
um, Google, et cetera, urging them to follow the policy that Facebook has announced. Um, but even what Facebook has done is not going to be a complete answer because uh, I'm not sure that it covers things like Chinese propaganda about where the virus originated. Um, you know, if the Chinese are, are, and you heard some Chinese military officers say, basically this was American military people introducing it in China. I don't know whether that's within the category of what Facebook has in mind. Uh, and so we're gonna have to, I think collectively, um, fight some of these pernicious misinformation uh, campaigns online uh, and not completely depend on the platforms to do that. Yes, indeed. Um, we have several questions on regarding uh, personal protective equipment um, and uh, several uh, participants who are uh, either admin hospital administrators or physicians are asking, what is um, the federal government's plans in ensuring that community hospitals and practitioners have adequate PPEs uh, to best be prepared to handle this pandemic? Well, this is a, an issue that uh, really calls for a national response. And I'm sure you've seen the spectacle um, that we all have of, over the last couple months of states competing with other states to try to buy protective uh, equipment, uh, to try to get uh, masks and face shields and other uh, gowns and other necessary protective equipment. Uh, you've had literally governors on the phone with uh, buyers or with sellers in China, in Europe or elsewhere, negotiating purchases uh, who have reached a deal only to be told that, I'm sorry, you just were outbid by another state. Uh, or even more pernicious, I'm sorry, you were just outbid by the federal government. Uh, it shouldn't be that way. And uh, it shouldn't have been that way over ventilators. It shouldn't be that way over protective gear. This is, you know, this is a situation where you really need national leadership um, to be driving resources to where they're needed. Uh, I think that the president should invoke the Defense Production Act. Now, the president has been saying they've been making use of it. The reality is they have not been making use of it. They've been making use of the threat of it. That act is very powerful, and it can require companies to manufacture certain basic essentials. Uh, the president talks about this being a warlike effort, a wartime-like effort. Uh, well, we need the kind of industrial capacity in this country devoted to mass producing this gear in short order. Uh, and so the power of that office is not being utilized the way it needs to, both to compel the production of this gear and to make sure that it is distributed uh, in a even-handed fashion to the states, going out to those who need it most at this point in time. Um, and that's not something the states are able to do on their own. Now, the governors, you know, many of them have formed regional alliances uh, in the absence of national leadership, uh, where governors of neighboring states, Democrats and Republicans have banded together uh, to say, OK, we're going to swap ventilators. We're going to lend you some of ours now. You give them back to us when we when we need them. Uh, if you need the gear now, we'll help you with the gear now. Uh, that really, you know, it's wonderful to see the governors working so well together like that, but that really ought to be a federal responsibility. So I hope with the additional funding we're providing for the response that the administration will use it wisely. We'll use those resources to dramatically ramp up the production necessary. Uh, you know, it, it, uh, it only helps the Chinese propaganda coup, very frankly, for China to be donating protective gear to us right now, which they're doing. Uh, and it's not like we're in a position to turn it away. But given our industrial capacity, we should be able to be an export of protective gear rather than beholden to others. Uh, and, and I just want to see every effort made to make that happen. Uh, the president today was talking about washing protective gear, reusing masks. Uh, you know, these may be necessary last resorts, but that shouldn't be the national strategy. There's really no excuse now, two months or more into this pandemic, uh, to still not have the testing we need, to still not have the protective gear that we need. It's really just inexcusable. We, we have another question along the same lines, and, and that is, um, we keep hearing President Trump repeatedly saying when he became president, he inherited a situation 
which he describes it as shelves were empty for PPEs, gloves, ventilators, et cetera. What's your understanding of Trump constantly justifying this absurd and false excuse? Thank you. Well, um, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm doing my best here because I know we're a nonpartisan group tonight uh, to be uh, restrained in my critique of the administration. But uh, there was a pandemic office set up in the White House in the National Security Council by the prior administration that was to act as a tripwire when there were early signs of something that could become a pandemic. Uh, and you know, given the experience in China with coronaviruses, um, you know, there was a lot of reason historically to worry about these kind of respiratory infections coming out of China. Um, that office was disbanded by this administration. Uh, and I suspect the reason why it was disbanded is, you know, this kind of idea that anything that was done by the prior administration had to be a terrible idea. We're going to get rid of it. Um, but the result was uh, we were caught very flat footed. Uh, and, you know, three and a half years into a presidency, you can no longer blame the last administration for your inability to be prepared for any national emergency. So uh, if the stockpiles were not what President Trump thought they should have been, when he became president, he had three and a half years to do something about it, and he didn't. Um, but you know, more graphically, um, when we knew this was becoming a pandemic, and indeed when it became a pandemic, there was still a lot of happy talk from the president administration about how this was no worse than the flu, and, and, and that anybody who was saying otherwise was participating in a hoax. And those were the kind of words that he was using. Uh, now to try to fob this off on a prior administration, I, I just don't think works. You know, I will say this, I, I've introduced the bill to establish a commission, a 9-11 kind of a commission. Um, it's the same model in my legislation that we used to establish the original 9-11 commission. It would be 10 members of the commission. The chair would be appointed by the president. It would not be a currently elected officials. Uh, this isn't something that I'm putting together or, or proposing because I want to chair it. No, uh, this would be apolitical people, healthcare experts, epidemiologists, scientists, um, who would look at our preparedness for this pandemic, who would look whole of government to our response to this pandemic, and make recommendations about how to protect the country in the future. Um, there are Republicans who are supporting the concept in the Congress um, I have to say we will meet resistance in establishing this commission. But then after 9-11, there was likewise resistance to establishing a commission because the then Bush administration thought it would be critical of the fact that it happened under the watch of George W. Bush. Now the Bush administration ended up being supportive and helpful to the commission. Um, regardless, this commission that I propose in my legislation won't get started until early next year after the election, so it's not a political thing. Um, but we really do need someone to take a very objective look at why we were so ill-prepared, um, why we had such a long ramp up in testing and we're still not there, why we don't have the protective equipment and the ventilators we need, um, why uh, we didn't have more of our resources trained to this problem set, given that it's been far more devastating than any terrorist attack on our country. Uh, and so these are all important questions that need to be answered. I think the victims of this virus, a lot of people on the front uh, lines of the virus uh, fight in our healthcare system are gonna require good, objective, honest answers to these questions. Uh, and and we're, we're just gonna need to get them because we're gonna have to protect the country a lot better in the future. Of course. Um... Congressman, we have several questions in regarding the PPP and um, asking your thoughts about uh, big corporations getting uh, bigger slices of that those monies, whereas uh, smaller businesses were left out. What are your thoughts and what's being done to safeguard small businesses getting their fair share moving forward? Well, you know, I think it's just uh, a, a appalling that some large successful businesses were taking advantage of this program, even large universities were taking advantage of the program, um, when it was clearly meant for uh, smaller businesses struggling to survive. 
uh, and they're properly being called on the carpet for doing it. And some of them are paying back the money. Uh, you know, some of these very successful like restaurant chains and others, uh, I'm sure they looked at it and said, you know, we're having to lay off our employees too. Um, this is just money sitting on the table. We'd be a fool not to pursue it. But, uh, you know, we have to, um, I think, put uh, safeguards in a program like this to prevent it's being ab abused and to make sure that the money goes out to the right. Uh, uh, those that are, are the most in need, the, the, the rightful targets of this aid. Um, you know, most of us, many of us wanted to do those programmatic fixes in the bill we voted on today. Uh, but um, there were others um, who were vehemently opposed to making programmatic changes. Uh, and, uh, you know, for one, Mitch McConnell made it abundantly clear he was not going to allow any kind of programmatic change. He simply just wanted more money added to the program. So it's a process of negotiation. Neither side gets what it wants. But frankly, um, I think that uh, the prospect of the banks using this to advantage their, their better customers um, is, is just uh, appalling. And, uh, you know, I'm sure for the banks, the large banks, they, they view this as good business and it probably is good business, but, you know, that's not the purpose of this fund. And so I think we, we do need to uh, do vigorous oversight of how these funds are being used. There's very little penalty for businesses to say they need the money when they don't. Uh, it's largely a good faith declaration. Uh, there's uh, really no teeth in it at this point. Um, and if they pay the money back within a certain po point of time, it doesn't matter whether their representation, representation was truthful or not. There seems to be no repercussion for that. So there are some flaws that have already become evident. Uh, and you know you can anticipate this because Congress had to act so quickly because businesses were going under every day, thousands and tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of businesses laying off people. And so we needed to get money out quickly. Um, but, uh, uh, but we do need to, I think, um, make further reforms to these programs, do careful oversight of these programs, uh, make sure that um, we have an approach that, that uh, really meets uh, those in need. And, you know, the final thing I'll mention, and this gets back to something I raised earlier, I continue to think that the best and simplest approach is the one that Britain is using, where the federal government is guaranteeing 80% of payroll. Uh, and in that, in that structure, it doesn't matter whether you're a large business or a small business or a medium-sized business. Uh, it, just, it just matters that you have a payroll to meet. Uh, it's better that you meet your payroll, that you not have to lay off your employees. Uh, it's better for your business. It's better for the economy. It's better for the employee. Uh, when this is over, they don't have to go look for work because they already have work. So you have a quicker recovery. It can be done through the, the tax system, through the IRS, rather than through the banks and the SBA. So it can be scaled uh, much more quickly. Um, this is something I've been advocating for the last two months. Uh, it, it's what I hope uh, we will move towards in the next package. Um, but that would, um, I think, mitigate or do away with a lot of the problems we're seeing in these specific programmatic efforts. Thank you, Congressman. We have a question from uh, Dr. Arthur Ohanesian from uh, UCLA Family Medicine Residency Training Program. Um, and his question is, Will there be a federal bill to provide student loan debt forgiveness for all healthcare workers impacted by this? Will, and second part question is, uh, will you sponsor such a, such a bill? Um, you know, I think there is legislation um, on this already. Um, as I sit here, I believe that uh, um, I saw a request from one of my colleagues, which I joined, that we support a bill to do exactly that. And I will look into it after this call. I, I want to say, uh, although my memory is not as good as it used to be, um, it is a bill, I think, that Raul Ruiz um, from uh, the Palm Desert area, who is himself an emergency physician, uh, may be introducing if it hasn't been introduced yet. But, uh, but I know that idea of 
for, forgiving um, the loan debt uh, for uh, medical students and other healthcare professionals uh, is being proposed. It's certainly something that I will support. Um, and, uh, and I think uh, uh, in addition to frankly, that approach, uh, we're gonna have to look more broadly at providing relief for um, college students and college graduates uh, who, like my own uh, recent college graduate, our daughter just graduated, um, she had a dream job lined up that went away before her first day of work. Uh, and so for students that are graduating with debt um, and now no longer have a job um, or no prospect of getting a job, uh, there, there needs to be some suspension of their obligation to pay back those loans until they're in a position where they can do so. So we have a question from Agarin Ohanesian, who is the nursing supervisor for the Los Angeles County Department of Public Health. By the way, um, the Public Health Department has been uh, very proactive for the community. We're lucky to have Garen in the department who's been sharing um, the daily updates from the health department. Uh, and we've been uh, sharing it with our community. And she asks, is there any way to create public health hospitals, especially for big cities such as Los Angeles and New York, so that we can use those facilities when needed with a core team always working there and have traveling staff when there is a need? Secondly, for PPEs, is there a way to pass a bill to have a certain number of companies to be made only in the US so that we can depend on ourselves and can have uh, secondary resources. Thank you for your service, she says. Well, thank you for the question and thank you for your service uh, now more than ever. Um, you know, taking your, your last uh, question first, um, you know, there, there are a couple of things that uh, I think can be done and need to be done um, the first is under that Defense Production Act, uh, the president can prohibit the export of certain essential commodities right now. So if there are reagents, protective gear, et cetera, we want to make sure obviously, or components uh, for that, that uh, those are not exported if there is a essential need for them right now. But we also need to think about uh, developing a supply chain for certain essential um, uh, either medications or uh, equipment uh, domestically so that we're not put in this position in the future. Um, indeed, and I won't claim any clairvoyance here, but uh, Anna Eshu, one of my colleagues and I, um, wrote an op-ed uh, about uh, six months ago about our dependence on China in the area of pharmaceuticals. Uh, some of the active uh, um, or inactive ingredients in many pharmaceuticals um, are made in China. And, uh, and some uh, vital uh, antibiotics are made in China. We don't manufacture any of them in this country anymore. Uh, and at that time, since six months ago, Anna Eshu and I were talking about how we need to explore the development of those fundamental precursors um, or components to medication in the United States because if it were a trade dispute with the China or a military dispute in the South China Sea and China wanted to throw its weight around and use its leverage, uh, it might deprive us of needed medications. Well, that's not the scenario we're facing at the moment, but we're facing a different bottleneck, a different constriction and a different point of leverage for China. Uh, so I do think that we need to explore what essential uh, equipment, supplies, material, do we need to have a domestic supply chain that is always assured? Um, you know, likewise on the question of whether we can develop a public hospital capacity that is always a standing capacity and it's one that you can search, but one that, uh, that is maintained, um, you know, as a, essentially a rainy day uh, fund uh, for lack of a better description, for um, a public health emergency. This is really one of the things that I'm hoping that this 9-11 Light Commission can do, which is look at our state of preparedness now, look at the vulnerabilities this pandemic has exposed, look at other vulnerabilities that maybe haven't been exposed yet in this pandemic, 
and make recommendations about what do we need to do to expand our public health infrastructure? What do we need to do in terms of uh, bringing some of our supply chain back to the United States for more than rare earth minerals, more than certain vital technologies, and we've had those discussions vis-a-vis -vis China, but also in the healthcare area. So these are the kind of recommendations that I, I would hope would come out of this kind of a commission. Um, and you know, in, in the wheelhouse where I um, have my greatest responsibility in the Intel world, uh, I'm doing my own oversight to develop recommendations about how the intelligence community can be better focused on this threat, how it can be better resourced, how it can be better integrated with the public health community. Uh, and I think we need to do that in each of these disciplines. So, you know, without even waiting for this commission, I think the, the Energy and Commerce Committee needs to be doing a similar analysis. Uh, it has jurisdiction over many of the healthcare issues in the Congress. Uh, and many other committees also need to be thinking about exactly these questions. Thank you, Congressman. Um, Dr. Galstian has a question for us. If you can unmute Dr. Galstian and uh, proceed with your question, please. Congressman, thank you. Uh, situation in the country changing rapidly and a question regarding what we're going to do in the fall and winter of 2020 when uh, flu season will be coming. And I'm not only talking about healthcare, I'm talking about groceries, traveling. Is there any special programs or any new recommendations coming up for coming winter? Thank you. Uh, you know, I think that the, the predominant concern right now uh, for the winter is this, uh, the contemporaneous challenge of a flu and the, the, uh, the COVID pandemic and what stress and strain that places on our healthcare system. Now, uh, it's entirely possible that that also places enormous stressor on other systems uh, like our food system and our grocery stores, our transportation systems. If you have more people sick, more people spreading illness, it puts a strain on everything. I have to say though, we have time between now and the winter to prepare for that. Um, we are you know, still obviously dealing with a, a coronavirus that has not reached its peak in many parts of the country. So it's not as if uh, we can take our eye off the ball right now with the challenges we have. But I would presume that between now and next winter, um, things will get easier before they get harder again. And we need to make full use of that time to get prepared, uh, to make sure that we have the excess capacity in the healthcare system, to make sure that to the degree that there have been problems in other essential services that we fix those problems. You know, right now, as you've probably seen, um, we are having a major outbreak in many of the meat packing plants. Uh, and so we're gonna have to pay attention to what are the conditions in those plants that are leading to this kind of spread of the virus. And um, otherwise we're gonna have a lot of food shortages in particular areas. Uh, you know, likewise, um, in East Hollywood right now, which is part of our, our congressional district, uh, there is a skilled nursing facility that has, um, I think over a hundred uh, positive coronavirus cases, about half of them staff. Uh, it is a major hotspot. And of course, there are hotspots like that all over the country in skilled nursing facilities. Uh, and we need to figure out how to deal with that um, and protect those most vulnerable uh, of our uh, citizens, many of our older citizens. Uh, so we need to use this time wisely, uh, both to tackle the immediate challenge, but to get ready for the winter. And you know, maybe we're lucky and maybe we have a mild flu season, uh, but maybe we're not lucky. You know, let's hope for the best, prepare for the worst. Uh, and if we do, we'll be in good, good shape. Uh, but this is a time now, I think, to analyze where there are problems, where there are shortages, you know, like all of you, I go to the grocery store and I go down that aisle looking for paper towel, paper towels or toilet paper or whatever, uh, and it's completely empty. Um, or I go to, uh, you know, the meat section and it's empty, uh, depending on what time of day you get there. And, you know, we, we need to use this time to figure out how to address those supply problems, some of which are artificial. I think the shortage in those paper products is completely artificial. Uh, it, it probably is people just hoarding it, but uh, in any event, let's use the, the time wisely that we have. 
Of course, that's, those are uh, great comments, uh, Congressman. And I'd like to, um, in addition to echoing those, also make add to it is that it's perhaps also a time where we look into ourselves and make sure that we are in the best possible health that we can be in the event that you know this virus comes back, especially during flu season. I see one of the participants is Dr. Daniel Stambulian, who's a prominent infectious diseases specialist, and he's participating from Buenos Aires. We've been talking on a weekly basis, and one of the first things he said about two, three months ago that everybody should be vaccinated against the flu, uh, because uh, in the event that you know uh, we get uh, co-infected with two different uh, bugs that could be super catastrophic. Of course, there are vulnerable uh, populations and, and there are certain risk factors, uh, hypertension, diabetes, and obesity being some of the top risk factors. And uh, as Americans, it seems that uh, over 50% of us are either obese or overweight. And perhaps, you know, this may be uh, this should serve as a wake up call for all of us to do the best that we can to take care of our health in the best way, to take care of the, um, the health of, of our loved ones who are surrounding us, in addition to our patients and, and our communities. Um, I'd like to tell a personal story, Congressman, if it's okay with you. Uh, five years ago today, or actually five years ago tomorrow, um, uh, you and I, along with a group of uh, uh, athletes, jumped on our bikes and started a uh, a coast to coast bicycle uh, rally from LA to DC. I just can't believe that you know we blinked and that was five years ago. Wow. Uh, that, yeah, and that that uh, bicycle rally was in commemoration of the hundred year. Uh, commemoration of the Armenian genocide in back in 2015. Um, we rode our bicycles uh, through the country um, from town to town, sharing various stories of, uh, of genocide and raising awareness. And then the, that, that group of cyclists ended in Washington, D.C., carrying a message for us. And that message you so graciously read on the floor of the Congress and has been, is part of the uh, official congressional record. I just wanted to share that story as, um, you know, a call for action for perhaps all of us to uh, be a little introspective during these hard times. And in addition to trying to be a better version of ourselves for our communities, not to forget the health aspect of it. Uh, a lot of us have become sedentary. We're or, you know, our normal activities have been impacted, uh, but a big risk factor is other comorbidities where oftentimes these comorbidities can potentially be preventable. So if there is a vaccine, let's use it uh, if appropriate. Obviously it's not for everybody. I don't wanna, again, uh, uh, you know, be bombarded by uh, people who may not have the same beliefs as the, uh, the medical community regarding vaccinations, but you know the, these are different times and we ought to uh, take um, necessary steps. Now, uh, Congressman, there are several questions in regards to vaccines. In fact, one uh, particular question is commenting on the UK beginning to use a, a, a version of a vaccine already on human subjects. Is there any sharing of information between governments so that we can benefit from uh, any beneficial effects of therapeutics or uh, preventative measures such as vaccines? You know, as far as I know, the answer is yes. Uh, there is a lot of information sharing about what we're working on, what our friends and allies are working on. Um, there is, uh, for lack of a better description, though a healthy competition for the development of a vaccine, both uh, in terms of the, uh, you know, the financial stakes, but also, you know, the pride uh, of uh, being the first to um, come up with a vaccine for this global crisis. Um, there are, and you would have a better sense of this than I do, some unrealistic expectations 
uh, about how quickly that can be accomplished. Um, at the, I don't know how many of you saw the press conference today, but at one point uh, the president said that we're very close to having a vaccine. Um, and then another point said, but we're not close because there haven't been any human trials of it. Um, the human trials are pretty important. And uh, look, I would love nothing better than for us to have a, a vaccine uh, next week or next month. But uh, you know, the experts tell us that if it can be done within a year, that is lightning speed for the development of a vaccine against a new virus like this. Um, and we need to make sure that um, we don't risk making an already terrible situation worse um, by either vaccinating people with something that causes bad side effects or something that doesn't fully protect them or uh, something that causes the virus uh, to mutate in ways that make it even more difficult to fight. Uh, and so uh, we need to get this right. Um, I've seen uh, a lot of press reporting about Israel being very far along in the development of a vaccine. I hope that's true. I hope the British are far ahead. Uh, you know, the one area where I, I am concerned that we may discourage cooperation is that about a month ago, the administration openly speculated about buying a German company that was developing a vaccine. Um, well, you can imagine how the German government felt about that idea. Um, to the degree that other countries worry about us poaching their, uh, their companies, their intellectual product or talent, uh, that may chill uh, cooperation that we want to encourage. But uh, I think, you know, among those uh, in the scientific community that work on problem sets like this, there is a lot of information sharing. Uh, and I, I, as far as I understand, that continues. Um, and uh, I'll certainly let you know if I start to hear otherwise. Great, thank you, Congressman. We're gonna take three more questions and there's, I mean, we're, we're, there are so many, so many more questions I've been going up and down and these are great questions, but for the sake of time and the Congressman's time is very valuable, um, we'll just take three more. And we have a question from Dr. Armin Cherik uh, who first greets you and says, hello. And his question is about, um, you know, uh, Little Armenia and East Hollywood and it having one of the highest per capita rates in Los Angeles County, 952 cases per 100,000. Um, is this being looked into? Do we know why and what are any steps that, that are being taken to mitigate this? Um, you know, we certainly are looking into it. I know the city of LA is looking into it. I'm deeply concerned about it. As, uh, as I mentioned earlier, this is a part of my constituency that I'm very concerned about. Uh, you know, I think that there are certainly a number of hypotheses about it already, uh, because what we're seeing in East Hollywood, we are seeing in other communities like East Hollywood in other parts of the country. And that is that communities of color uh, are being very hard hit by this virus. Um, lower income communities are also being very hard hit and densely populated areas are being hard hit. Uh, when I looked at the early statistics on the spread of the virus within LA County, and I looked at how many cases there were in Glendale and in Burbank and how many in uh, the Melrose area, how many in Beverly Hills, how many in Brentwood, um, you could early on see some patterns uh, and, you know, we tried to figure out what explains those patterns. West Hollywood had a lot of cases of the virus. Uh, and some, I think it was apparent where in West Hollywood, which is an affluent community, I think, unlike many parts of East Hollywood, uh, it was density. Um, West Hollywood is mostly apartment dwellers who live very close. Uh, in, in cities like New York City, you see rapid spread of the virus, I think in part because of population density. Um, and you also see, though, in other parts of the country um, where uh, there are, are communities who have had poor access to health care, where there are a lot of people that are in poor health, um, that you have a spread and increase in the mortality of the virus because of those comorbidities that you were talking about, comorbidities. And so uh, this is something we have to pay, I think, very careful attention to. Uh, you know, in Wisconsin, for example, where I think 7% of the population is African-American, 40% of the fatalities are African-American. 
And, you know, I think what the virus is showing us is some persistent inequities within our society um, uh, in terms of access to health care. Uh, I, you know, I'm concerned that this small business program, although it wasn't intended, obviously, to have this effect, is going to aggravate already um, unequal access to capital between different communities. Uh, and so I think there are probably, a, you know, several explanations for why East Hollywood is being hard hit right now. But I suspect that the density of East Hollywood, um, the lesser access to health care in East Hollywood, uh, and the lower income part of East Hollywood is part of the answer. Um, you know, one final observation about more dense and, and lesser affluent communities, they don't have the same uh, opportunity as more affluent families to isolate and distance themselves from each other. So if you or I have a family member who gets sick uh, with the COVID, we might be able to sequester them away in a bedroom or a basement. Um, if you're living in close quarters because you can't afford a bigger place and there are two or three people living in the same, uh, sleeping in the same room uh, and you're in you know, a one bedroom apartment, you can't distance yourself the way others can. Uh, and so there's much more family spread in those more densely populated areas. So I think these are part of the answers, but um, there's still so little we know about the virus in its history. You know, one, one final point, um, and I'm sure that you all have seen this uh, reporting in the last day or two, but uh, the first known fatality now from coronavirus in the United States was not at the end of February in Washington state. It was at the beginning of February in Santa Clara County. Um, that person who died in Santa Clara County, and I believe they died on Fe February 7th, um, didn't travel outside the country, um, hadn't been exposed to somebody that we know that had traveled outside the country, although they worked for a technology firm that had an office in Wuhan. Um, and uh, if she died on February 7th at that time for unknown causes, but now we know died from COVID, that means there was community transfer way before we thought. Um, it also means that we don't know where the virus has been. Um, and so it may, may very well have touched certain communities in Los Angeles, just as it did in Santa Clara County, earlier than we knew just by happenstance. Uh, so, um, you know, at this point, I, I think there are a lot of unanswered questions. There are some, I think, uh, you know, good um, hypotheses, uh, but we really need to do far more testing to get good answers. Thank you, Congressman. Uh, one, we have several questions in regards to what role should the federal government versus the states versus the municipalities be playing in as we revamp the economy, open up the economy? Well, I, I, look, I think there should be uh, federal leadership on this question. Uh, and I think we would have been far better off uh, if we had federal social distancing standards rather than an ad hoc basis in the states. Um, but I also think in addition to federal leadership, there should be a collaborative uh, working relationship with the states because all the, the states and the communities and the counties and the regions are not similarly situated. Um, and so it's not necessarily the case that every part of the country has to open at the same time. I don't think that's uh, the model or that the federal government should um, uh, set a rigid standard um, that all the states have to comply with. But there needs to be federal leadership because if one state um, completely reopens uh, when their curve is still going up through the roof, as is the case with Georgia right now, um, then Georgia doesn't get to keep that problem to itself because people are going to travel from state to state. Uh, and so why should the people of the state next to Georgia have to suffer from poor decision making within the state of Georgia? So there needs to be national leadership. There also needs to be collaborative uh, working relationship between the, the presidency and the states. Uh, they should be working hand in hand. They should be trying to harmonize uh, what the country is doing. Uh, you know, I am very concerned uh, with these organized rallies now to push states to open before they're ready. 
Uh, and these rallies um, are uh, being organized and funded um, and uh, they are not spontaneous creations, although many Americans are drawn to them quite spontaneously. But nonetheless, it is part of a political effort. Uh, and I, I'm deeply concerned that um, if we are guided by the politics rather than the science, um, we are going to lose uh, tens of thousands of uh, more lives uh, needlessly. Um, and, you know, to get back to one of the questions that was asked earlier about um, what China is doing or other countries are doing or saying or misinformation online, the pandemic will be the great wedge issue in the fall. Um, and that means that people are going to be exploiting the pandemic for political gain in one direction or another. Um, I think it's way too serious for that and way too deadly for that. Uh, and um, to agitate, um, to, to egg on these protesters, to ignore the science and reopen, is just gonna to lead to more misery and death in my view. So I think we need to be very, very careful. I was speaking to someone uh, earlier today um, who works in Japan and was participating in a multinational discussion of the pandemic. Uh, and I have to tell you, in other countries around the world, amongst our allies, as well as our adversaries, there is a scoffing at the United States right now uh, for a lack of leadership. Uh, there is a view that we can't even get our own act together where the president is fighting with the governors and there's division about opening or not opening, uh, where we're calling to defund uh, World Health Organization um, and uh, we're, we're having to go hat in hand to other countries to get gear. Uh, in addition to the, the health tragedy here, the economic tragedy here, the loss of our standing in the rest of the world is also palpable. Um, so we just have to do a much better job. Uh, and uh, I, I do think that we should let the healthcare experts guide us. Um, we need to make sure that we have the testing in place, the tracing in place, the capacity to isolate in place, the capacity in our healthcare systems in place before we can really talk about reopening or we're just gonna do the country more damage. Thank you, Congressman. Those, those are great points. And as uh, many of the viewers today and the members of the organization are healthcare professionals, physicians, pharmacists, dentists, nurses, and other specialists that you know heavily are um, in your district, we really have been as a group uh, taking this opportunity to get together, share the latest science, science that is available and, uh, and share it with, with our colleagues, with our community, with our patients. Um, and as much as there is this uh, political bickering and partisanship that is uh, unfortunately going on, I think that uh, our message has been just look at the science and use the best known uh, sound information to best care for our communities. And, and that's been the message. Just to let you know, Congressman, uh, for an organization that is in your district, we have been uh, engaged in daily educational webinars uh, in a, in a multi-specialty manner. Uh, we've been collaborating with uh, groups of physicians, hospitals from all over the globe. In fact, on this call, um, there are people watching from the Middle East, South America, north of the border, Canada, uh, Uruguay, um, you know, Europe, believe it or not, it's, it's got to be 3, 4 a.m. there. Um, and we've been trying to share um, the, the latest information uh, directly from some of the frontline areas uh, to our communities, uh, to our colleagues, so that we can be best prepared. I'm going to ask you. Can, can, I, can I just mention on that? And I, and I, I just want to thank you for doing all that. Your voices as medical professionals are so important right now. I don't think they've ever been more important. I was really moved in watching the news last night um, where they were interviewing healthcare providers uh, in New York City. 
Um, and these are people that are seeing their patients die every day, multiple deaths every day. Some of them are veterans and it's worse than what they saw when they were in a war theater. Um, they're devastated, they're exhausted, they're devastated. And I remember one of them being asked, what do you think about these protests to reopen the economy? Uh, and there they are, they're pouring their heart out, they're working their heart out, they're, they're showing an iPad to a dying patient so they can say goodbye to their family because the family member can't be there. They're giving everything they can and they see people out there protesting to um, make the problem worse. And, you know, they're at their wits end. And uh, to me, that, that juxtaposition of those exhausted healthcare workers who are risking their own health, who go home and sometimes don't go home, they stay in a hospital or a tent in their front yard because they don't want to affect their family. Um, and they see people out there making light of it uh, or thinking they can just um, develop some kind of herd immunity to it. Well, you know, if you adopt the herd immunity strategy, there, there are going to be a lot of people in the herd who end up dying. Um, and there are going to be a lot of healthcare providers who end up dying. Uh, and so uh, your voices right now are respected um, and they're enormously important. Thank you. Thank you, Congressman. Thank I'll you. take the last question, um, which uh, is actually coming from somebody who's from the East Coast. And it is um, asking about if any advice you would have from an economic standpoint on what we should all be doing in preparation for the second wave in the event that there is a second wave. Well, you know, I think that um, what we're likely to see, and, and you would probably have a better sense than I do, um, is a series of waves of this um, where we get the virus under control, we start to relax our social distancing, we see um, uh, it flare up uh, and we need to suppress it. Um, and we see a wave uh, in this part of the country, in that city or this town, we need to reimpose discipline, social distancing, get it under control. Um, we may see seasonal waves uh, like another one in, in next winter. But this will be with us in one form or another until we have a vaccine. And then even after we have a vaccine, uh, you know, depending on the rate of mutation of the virus and whether it develops into a strain that is no longer um, amenable to the same vaccine, we may need a different vaccine each year to deal with this particular challenge. Uh, so this problem is gonna be with us for a while, one form or another, and I, I think it's important to speak plainly and realistically about it. I think the American people can handle it. They can handle being told the truth about it and this is gonna be hard. Um, I, the reason I've been advocating for this payroll guarantee is because I think that it allows the country to recover more quickly than any other uh, strategy. Uh, if people don't have to look for work when the economy starts to reopen because they have remained employed through it all, it's, it's much better economically, but it's also much better for that family uh, to have that steady income and not to go through the, the, the trauma and the indignity of losing their job. Um, and so, you know, one great way to prepare economically is a national uh, program in which the federal government uh, guarantees payroll until we get through this. Um, but, um, uh, in terms of other ways to prepare economically for the next wave, um, you know, I think we, we will learn from our experience and the experience of other countries. Uh, if you look at those that are further ahead of us uh, in dealing with this problem, like Singapore, uh, Taiwan, South Korea, and other places, um, we see, uh, you know, they did not have the terrible outbreak we did because they got the testing and the tracing done early on. But uh, they also had influxes when people returned back to the country. Um, they had influxes uh, or they had uh, surges of the virus when they relaxed too much and they had to reimpose uh, distancing and tracing and whatnot. Um, so we're, we should try to learn from the experience of other countries. 
Um, we should also, I think, bring technology to bear. The tracing task is so large that we're gonna need an enormous workforce to focus on it. And we can put some of the folks who are unemployed to work doing that. We've had to recall our Peace Corps workers. We can have our Peace Corps. Uh, I'm working on a bill right now to have our Peace Corps and our Conservation Corps workers working on contact tracing. Um, but we're, we should also harness the power of technology. And I was glad to see Apple and Google, two otherwise competitors, team up to try to develop a technology where in a anonymous fashion, we can get alerts on our phone uh, if we have come uh, close or in contact with someone who's tested positive. Um, so I think by marshalling technology, learning from the experience of others, uh, embracing a, an economic strategy nationally, we can prepare for these subsequent waves, large or small, of this virus. Thank you, Congressman. And I just want to take a quick moment to really um, applaud and uh, uh, give thanks to our colleagues who are on the East Coast. I do see some participants are uh, logging in from New York and Pennsylvania and Massachusetts. Um, many of us have gone through uh, our paths through where we get to, whether it's medical school, residency, or fellowships have gone through some of these very hard hit hospitals. And I just want to say, give a quick shout out to all of you. Uh, we're praying for you. We are, we are with you. Thank you for uh, uh, chiming in uh, and participating in this. And um, anything you need, please, please uh, call out to, to us. Um, Congressman, uh, in last comments, today is April 23rd. Um, this week of April is a, a very serious week for many of us whose backgrounds or, or um, ancestors have experienced various uh, atrocities and genocide. Earlier this week was Holocaust uh, commemoration. Um, uh, tomorrow is the commemoration of the 105th year of the Armenian genocide. And I think I, from uh, our community, from our organization, we really would like to uh, applaud for all the championing and advocacy that you have done uh, to, um, to recognize this uh, uh, horrible atrocity in our history uh, so that you know, atrocities, genocides like this do not occur again. Uh, I'd like to say thank you for all that you've done. I know you have a very busy day tomorrow and, and the next few days uh, for various you know, commemoration events uh, in, in our community. Uh, Congressman, if it's okay with you, I am going to invite uh, our board members. There's, there's nine of us to get on the screen to take a group photo with you if, if, uh, if it's not too much to ask for. We'll take, uh, once everybody uh, gets on, we'll take a screenshot. And we're very, very thankful of your time. Um, I know your time is very precious. And we had said that we would do this for an hour, but uh, we've gone a little bit past that. Um, and if we can just have everybody join us um, and we'll take the quick photo and uh, it is getting late out there, I know, and, and we will, um, uh, let the congressman get some rest. I know it's been a very busy day. Uh, we can, uh, if I could just uh, uh, um, conclude by thanking you for inviting me again. Uh, and Kevin, thank you as the, uh, the new president for your leadership. Uh, it's been a pleasure to uh, chat with you this evening. Um, uh, on the, the subject of the genocide uh, commemoration, I just want to tell you how thrilled I am that we were finally able to pass the genocide resolution in the House and Senate uh, just a few months ago. Um, I know so many of you who have worked on that for decades and decades. Um, I've been carrying that bill for 19 years and uh, finally uh, we were successful in getting it passed and I just always hoped that we would while there were still some survivors among us and, and we did so but, but only barely. Um, and it's my profound hope that tomorrow the president will join the bipartisan vote that we had in the House uh, with his own recognition of the genocide. 
Um, and uh, I look forward to participating in the commemorations tomorrow, uh, albeit uh, from a distance. Uh, and Vikan, um, I, uh, I want to thank you too for uh, citing the, the bike ride that we did um, rather than uh, boasting about the triathlons we did. Um, Vikan and I did, uh, he's done many more than I have, but we did the Malibu Triathlon a couple of times. I would say that we did it together, but that would be a terrible disservice to Vikan. Uh, because he was miles ahead of me at all times, except for the start. Um, but uh, in any event, uh, just a delight to join you all and uh, happy to join you for a photo and, and to wish you all uh, uh, a happy, uh, a healthy uh, rest of your evening. And, uh, and I hope you'll uh, stay healthy and, and uh, I will be with you uh, in song commemoration uh, tomorrow. Thank, Thank you. you, Congressman. Uh, Dr. Karchikian, if you can unable your video so we can see you. Uh, Asmik as well, please uh, uh, disengage, turn on your video so we can see you. Um, Asmik, if you're there, there we go. And it looks like we have everybody and everybody smile. All right, perfect. Thank you very much, Congressman. Thank you very much, Dr. Galstian. Thank you for our board, entire board, who's really been working uh, tirelessly. I could see Dr. Bagdasarian, is, he's in his scrubs. He's been working every day. Dr. Barkhudarian, who's also there, he's been operating, doing some very high risk surgeries through the nose, even on infected patients. Some of the stories that we've heard are truly, truly uh, uh, encouraging and touching. Uh, true heroism. Thank you very much, everybody, for participating. We'll continue our webinar starting Monday. We'll be discussing COVID-19 in pregnancy. So please join us. Anybody who has a family member uh, who is pregnant, anybody who is pregnant or is interested in learning anything about that, please join us at 7 p.m. Thank you, Congressman, again. Everybody, please be safe, stay healthy, stay strong, and don't forget, take care of yourselves as well. That's very, very important. Thank you and have Thank a great you. night. Good night, everybody. Thank you, Congressman. Good night, everybody. Thank you, Congressman. Thank you. Thank you.